Good morning and welcome to our time of worship on Palm Sunday. In the name of Christ, who died and was raised by the glory of the Father, welcome. Grace, mercy and peace be with you all. Let's be quiet for a moment and confess our wrongdoing to God. Let us return to the Lord our God and say to him, Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead, but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring us his pardon and peace, now and forever. Amen. And the Collect, today's special prayer for Palm Sunday. True and humble King, hailed by the crowd as Messiah, grant us the faith to know you and love you, that we may be found beside you on the way of the cross, which is the path of glory. Amen. Our reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The dramatic events of what we call Palm Sunday are recorded with slight variations in all four Gospels. And with it, we begin the last week of the earthly ministry of Jesus. Let's explore this event that brought Jerusalem onto the streets. And as we examine it, a number of things stand out. Firstly, there is a prearranged signal. In our reading of the Gospels, we're familiar with a core group of disciples, Peter, James and John, 
who were present at the raising of the daughter of Jairus from the dead, the transfiguration, and Jesus' agonising prayers in Gethsemane before his arrest. It was Peter and John, alone of the disciples, who prepared the upper room for the last Passover meal. Then there were, as Mark explains, twelve, who he also named apostles, to be with him and to be sent out to proclaim the message. Beyond that, there were 70 or 72, the Greek manuscripts are almost evenly divided on this, followers sent on ahead of him to the places that he intended to visit. But there are others, unnamed and out of focus, who play their part too. Here we see this at work, although it's easy to miss it. Two disciples are sent on ahead to arrange Jesus' mount for the entry into the city. If anyone asks what is going on, they are to respond with a pre-arranged passphrase. Then the donkey and the colt too, in Matthew's account, will be readily released. The prepared donkey, the exchange of challenge and passphrase, the release of the donkey, comes out even more clearly in Mark's Gospel. A similar thing happens when the room for the final Passover meal is chosen later in the week. Jesus says, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house. The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Once again, this seems to indicate a wider network of followers than we often assume, and pre-arrangements and signals. Second, it is a provocative entry. We often read this story simply as a profound contrast between the nature of Jesus and worldly authority. A conquering king will be expected to enter on a war horse with his soldiers marching behind him. A Roman general, so successful that he was voted the right to a triumphal entry into Rome, did so with such a vast retinue of infantry and cavalry, captured slaves, treasures and other war booty, that it was traditional to employ a slave to stand behind him in his victory chariot and constantly whisper in his ear, You are mortal, you will die. You are mortal, you will die. To remind him that for all the pomp, he was still but a man and not a god. Yet on Palm Sunday... Jesus, whom we know to be the Messiah and God's Son, enters Jerusalem, as Matthew reminds us, quoting Zechariah 9.9, gentle and riding on a donkey. What greater contrast than this with the power and pomp of the world? But let's not overstate this, for this entry is full of shocking, controversial, provocative significance too. It is freighted with other meanings, and Jesus would have known it. Matthew reminds us how the circumstances fulfilled an Old Testament messianic prophecy. The cloaks and branches on the road are extravagant displays of excited devotion. The shouts of Hosanna, meaning save now, are both cries of praise, but also declarations of expectation. That there were messianic expectations seemed clear from the association of this 
with the declaration that Jesus is son of David. There is humility here, but there's something else going on too. Remember that while a Jewish king, Herod Antipas, might be ruling in Galilee, Jerusalem is in Judea. And since AD 6, it had been incorporated into the province of Syria under a direct Roman rule and subordinate to the governor of Syria. The Roman prefect, not actually a governor, Pontius Pilate, will soon play a key role in the unfolding story. And in Roman administered Judea, proclaiming Davidic kingship and shouting out verses from the Old Testament that probably had messianic characteristics to anybody that heard them was going to lead to trouble. Mark has the crowd crying out the explicitly provocative Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Roman military intelligence, no doubt assisted by local agents and translations, will have been listening to the cries on the streets with growing interest. Third, we see the impact on the city. It is no surprise that Matthew tells us when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. As well it might be. Remember, this was not a parade on a Sunday afternoon. This took place on a busy working day, not on the Jewish Sabbath, of course. Jerusalem was about its business and the streets, shops and markets would have been active and crowded. But this is about more than just the impact of noise and festival crowds on a busy city. This causes a stir for other reasons too. Other more fundamental reasons. Luke adds that some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The Pharisees know exactly what is going on and they don't like it one little bit. They read between the lines and it didn't take much analysis and saw the exalted claims being made for, and I suggest by, Jesus. But that was only one reason for concern among those watching and listening. Peace and stability was also on their mind. Let's just reflect on what it meant to stir up Jerusalem at Passover time. The population of the city was massively increased by the arrival of pilgrims and Passover offered an opportunity for political protests involving the great numbers of people who crowded into Jerusalem for its celebration. The Jewish historian Josephus, writing later in the first century, gives several examples where the festival turned violent. The event itself was politically highly significant and potentially explosive as the anniversary of the deliverance of the Jewish people out of Egyptian slavery into freedom. A fact emphasised by Josephus each time he mentions the holiday. Passover was the perfect time, theologically, to attempt a new deliverance, this time from Rome. The city was tinder dry, all it took was a spark, and the Jerusalem authorities knew it. We usually assume that the only reason that John the Baptist lost first his freedom and then his life was because he criticised the marriage of 
Herod Antipas with Herodias. But Josephus suggests that the underlying reason was that he attracted large crowds. Crowds were unpredictable, volatile, dangerous. They might be manipulated. They could become a threat. According to Josephus, once John became a crowd-pulling figure, his days were numbered. On Palm Sunday, the crowds are there and they're noisy. Romans and religious leaders watch with mounting concern. The ingredients are there for trouble. Someone is going to get hurt. Fourthly, and finally, we are told this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. One wonders what the Jerusalem street made of that. Galilee was separated from the holy city of Jerusalem in Judea by the non-Jewish territory of Samaria. Since the Assyrian conquest of the northern tribes in the 8th century BC, it had experienced a more mixed population, Jews and non-Jews. As far back as Isaiah, it had been described as Galilee of the nations, Galilee of the Gentiles. This had increased under Roman and Greek before that influence. We could overstress this, but from the perspective of Jerusalem, it seemed a long way from the heart of Judaism. And Galileans spoke a distinctive form of Aramaic, which is why Peter, at the time of the arrest of Jesus, could be easily identified as a Galilean. We learn from John's Gospel that Jesus' status as a prophet was compromised in the eyes of some Judeans by his northern origins. But some asked, surely the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee. And that's before we get to Nazareth. In John's Gospel, Philip, one of Jesus' disciples, excitedly invites a friend named Nathaniel to come and meet Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth, to which Nathaniel witheringly replies, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Enough said. So, all in all, it is both a dramatic and an intriguing and multi-layered, many-dimensioned event that takes place on Palm Sunday. Yes, it's exciting, it's festive, but it's also loaded with tension, with drama, with threat. Standing at Palm Sunday, it is less than one short week to Good Friday and the cross. We can begin to see why. So, what in this event particularly speaks to us now in 2020 in lockdown UK? Well, I think a number of things speak particularly to us at this moment. The first is linked to those prearranged signals and those unsung heroes. It challenges me to look for God at work beyond my expectations. All around me today, I see people stepping into gaps, stepping up to responsibilities, caring for others, playing their part at a time of challenge and stress. I want to celebrate God in all those areas of kindness. 
And each time I see goodness lived in line with God's way of doing things, I praise God for widening my horizons and my expectations. Whenever I see people like that, I see God at work. And people living their lives in line with God's way, whether they know it or not. Secondly, Jesus declares that his kind of kingdom, his kind of kingship, comes humbly in service into the business of the city and of life. This king enters on a donkey, not a war horse, and challenges me as he challenged Jerusalem in his own day to see things differently, to do likewise as he did. Because he declares that this is what God is like. Whatever the world's expectations of power and influence. And this humility, this service is what matters. Whatever others may think important to grasp. Thirdly, Jesus goes unafraid into a hostile and dangerous environment. He knows what he's doing. He knows the threat. But he declares his good news message of God's love, God's self-sacrifice, God's requirements, God's world-changing power and transformation. The Pharisees say, make them be quiet. We don't want to hear this. And he says, if I did that, then the stones would sing. And so we praise him in good times and in bad. We sing in easy times and in stress in certainty and in anxiety. We praise him because he deserves it. Regardless of our circumstances, regardless even of a sense of threat, because he is in it with us. He has come into the city and among people. And when we stand beside him and declare his love and praise him, even in tough times, even in the face of threat, we see transformation rippling out from us into our communities. We see even the stones singing. We see all things pointing to him who loves us enough to give his life for us, to die for us, to save us. And finally, look for God at work, even in Nazareth. Nothing is beyond his ability to transform it. Sometimes circumstances change. Always our perspectives can change if we'll let his power enable us to do so. And the more we ask, where is God in this? The more we will see him. And the more we ask, what does God want me to do in this? The more we will see our part for him, with him. In a hurting, confused and broken world, we declare the love of God who entered into its brokenness and lived and loved those in it. When we recognise this, then good can come from Nazareth or wherever 
whatever else we thought was irretrievable and hopeless. Amen. Let's declare what we believe. Let us affirm our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's be quiet for a moment and hold before our loving Father God, our hurting world, our communities, ourselves. Father God, we thank you for all those unsung heroes, all those men and women who are showing love and kindness lifting up others, taking on burdens at this time. We ask your strength, your peace, your grace for them. We thank you that Jesus came, declaring his form of Messiah, the one Messiah, the true Messiah, came in humble service. Help us to be humble, Help us to serve, particularly at this time of great need. Help us to do this for others and be channels of your love, your grace, your care. We know that we live today in a hostile and dangerous environment. We ask your comfort, strength, and peace for those who are afraid, for those who have lost loved ones, for those for whom the future is uncertain. But we know, Father God, that you sent your Son into such a world as this to stand beside us, to save us, to rescue us, to lift us up. May we hold on to that firm and solid faith, even in times of uncertainty, that you have come into the city, Lord Jesus. You are among us, you are loving us, and you are empowering us to love others. And finally, help us to see you in the most unlikely circumstances and the most unlikely people. Help us to see you in the Nazareths of our own minds. In areas that we thought were, are irretrievable and lost. Help us to see your power at work, your transforming work. Help us to praise you. That even if all else is silent, help us to be like those stones crying out your praise. Help us to be people of praise. As Jesus said, if people were silent, the stones would cry out. Help us to cry out in praise of you, our loving Lord, even in times of difficulty. Help us to see you and to know you. To your glory, Father. Amen.
we bring together all our prayers in the traditional words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As our time of worship on this Palm Sunday comes to its close now, let's bless each other and ourselves by saying the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. God bless you all. God bless us all. Amen.